Good evening. Uh, let me welcome you all to uh, this uh, evening's event uh, that is being sponsored by India Business Initiative uh, at uh, Columbia Business School. Uh, this is an initiative that we started just a few months ago. Um, and uh, as of today, we have uh, had a number of uh, events that uh, we have successfully completed. Uh, on June 17th, uh, Professor Sheena Engar spoke at Studio X uh, in Mumbai. Uh, September 15th, we had Professor Arvind Panagriya, uh, uh, a well-known economist uh, from uh, Economics Department, who spoke on what the Modi government must do to transform India uh, to a modern economy. Uh, October 6th, we had uh, Kimka Distinguished Speaker uh, Adil uh, Jainal Boy, uh, who uh, has been appointed by uh, the Prime Minister as uh, the head of National uh, Quality Council. And uh, he gave his uh, you know, uh, vision about what it takes uh, for India to move to the next step uh, as it grows. And October 13th, we had Hitendra Vadwa, uh, uh, our professor who spoke at Studio X. Uh, so the idea is to have uh, continuing faculty presence uh, in India, and have uh, you know industry as well as policymakers, industry leaders and policymakers come here uh, to our campus and share their vision uh, about India and how uh, you know we should take our country forward. So uh, today I have a great pleasure in welcoming uh, you know Daljit Singh. Uh, Daljit Singh is the president of uh, Fortis Healthcare Limited. Uh, and during his tenure of 12 years with Fortis, he has led the company's uh, projects uh, function, strategy, and organizational development function, and has held the office of a CEO. Uh, he's been an important member of the top management team of uh, Fortis Healthcare that has conceptualized, formulated, and implemented that growth strategy uh, to become India's leading healthcare delivery organization in a short period of uh, less than, uh, you know, uh, about 15 years. Uh, prior to joining Fortis, uh, Daljit Singh was on the board of directors of Imperial Chemical uh, Industries uh, of India, uh, and uh, he was the executive director in charge of human resources, manufacturing, external relations, uh, and communications. So he's an acknowledged expert and thought leader in the domain of healthcare delivery. He has represented Fortis at industry forums, such as the Confederation of Indian Industry, FICI, and led several healthcare-related committees. He's an active participant uh, on the World Economic Forum uh, and is a member of the steering uh, boards constituted by the forum to guide a number of major global projects on healthcare. So it's a real pleasure for us to have uh, Daljit here today. I also want to uh, you know, uh, welcome and introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Surya Mahapatra. Uh, Surya Mahapatra is an executive in residence uh, at Columbia Business School and former chairman, president, and CEO of Quest uh, Diagnostics. Uh, Surya is among a select group uh, of Indian-born, uh, you know, Fortune 500 chief executives and has held senior leadership positions in the healthcare industry for more than uh, 30 years. He's been a strong advocate of patient empowerment and accountability to improve healthcare and reduce costs. Uh, Dr. Mahapatra joined uh, Quest Diagnostics in February 1999 as Senior Vice President and Chief Operating Officer, was appointed President in June of 1999 and elected to the company's board of directors in October 2002. And in May 2004, he was appointed as CEO. So we're really fortunate here today to have two uh, very impressive representatives of, uh, you know, uh, from healthcare uh, industry. So the format of this evening uh, will be as follows. Daljit will make a presentation for about 20 minutes or so. And then uh, Daljit and Surya will, uh, uh, you know, engage in a panel discussions. And after that, uh, you know, we'll have the floor uh, open for questions. There's a microphone that is set up there, uh, and you could go there and ask uh, questions. So with that said, uh, let us give a warm welcome to Daljit Singh. Uh, thank you very much, Suresh. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Surya, great to see you here again. And some familiar faces. Manish was here as well. Uh, and the daughter of... Uh, of a very eminent person, an author, who wrote a book that you know, I studied when I did my chemical engineering, Halliday and Resnick. So I think we've got Gina Resnick somewhere there at the back. <laughs> and, um, and it's one of the finest books ever written, actually. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to be here, to be speaking on, on a topic which is, I'm sure, of immense interest to all of you and certainly to us in India. And what I seek to do today is really share a perspective about of um, at what stage healthcare is in India, what are the issues and challenges, how India is beginning to grapple with the issues. And from there onwards, I'm going to move on to um, uh, to speak about my own organization, Fortis Healthcare, not from a perspective of marketing it, but really from a perspective of sharing a case study of how private healthcare has come of age in our country, because private healthcare is doing a lot of great work in our country, as you shall see. So that's really the, the purpose, and I, and I will take about 20 to 25 minutes with your indulgence, Suresh, and after that, I think we'll have an open discussion. So, um, so the way that I've structured my presentation today is that the first part is going to talk about the Indian healthcare landscape, and the second part is going to be largely around the model that Fortis has actually developed, and which has created, I think, a fair bit of excitement, not only in India, but in many parts of the world. And we guys um, haven't got it right, I think. We still are experimenting, we are learning as we go along, and we believe that that's going to be the journey into the future. So let me just uh, uh, take you forward to some highlight items. Uh, India today uh, represents about 17% of the global population. Uh, in terms of the disease burden, we are at about 20%. So we tend to be perhaps more sick because we are not a fully developed nation. A large part of a population doesn't have access to the basic amenities. And uh, we have a somewhat of a unique situation that on one hand, uh, we are, we are um, you know, plagued with a lot of communicable diseases, infections, etc. Um, uh, our maternal and child mortality rates are amongst the worst in the world, which is not something to be proud of. And at the other end, we also have what we refer to as diseases of the lifestyle, NCDs, non-communicable diseases, cancers, cardiac, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes. And that too is of equal dimension. In fact, there isn't a disease in that domain which doesn't put India as the capital of the world. So we are, we are the diabetes capital of the world, we are the you know, cardiac disease capital of the world, and so on and so forth. And, and it's, a, it's a very, very major issue for us. And that, so in, in many respects, healthcare for us is the entire compendium uh, ranging from public health at one, one end to the very high end disease at the other end. Um, if you look at the way healthcare has grown, and these figures are frankly not very large, uh, India spends close to, if you look at today's figures, close to about $75 billion um, per annum on healthcare delivery, which is not a large sum of money considering the country that you represent. And you guys are close to $3 trillion, okay? What that really means is that on an average in India, we spend about 40 to $50 per capita, per person, per annum on healthcare. Uh, in the US, you're spending about $8,000 per person per annum. And uh, think about it, it's about 160 times or 200 times more than what India spends. And that's a, that's a, that's a huge difference. Um, and, and there are several reasons for it. One of the main reasons is that we are not a very um, uh, prosperous country, and the distribution of a population is highly uneven today. So where large parts of our people stay, uh, they have little or very poor access to healthcare, and their ability to pay for healthcare is extremely limited. And the government has not over the year, has over the years failed to provide a system which enables healthcare delivery to these people, even though there are so-called primary care centers, secondary care centers that the government has put up, but these are highly underserviced. So there's a huge challenge. But having said that, the good part of the story is that uh, the, the market is growing uh, quite rapidly. I was talking to some of the you know, audience members out here, and, I was, and, and, and they were complaining that, look, the market in US seems to have plateaued. Certainly not in, the, not in India. And we are looking at, it depends on what research study you look at, but you could find figures uh, you know, which are being projected that healthcare delivery market is growing from between 15 to 20% year on year. And that's a pretty significant amount for a population 
uh, of 1.3 billion people. I think what we need to represent is that as India becomes more prosperous, as 1% of our population makes a shift from below poverty line to the middle income category, or from the middle income category to the uh, you know, high income category, just 1%, it represents 13 million people. And when 13 million people um, have an ability to pay more for a particular service or goods and services, then the market really explodes on a, because it's on a, on a pretty low base. And I think that's really uh, the exciting part of the India story. Uh, if, we, if we look at the, um, the uh, other part of the landscape in terms of the infrastructure today, um, we are well below the world recommended averages on anything. Um, if you look at the number of beds, we have about 1.3 uh, million beds for a country of 1.3 billion. So that's, a, uh, that's very, very low, basically. It's all 1.3 um, uh, beds per thousand population, uh, as opposed to a World Health Organization recommendation of about three and a half beds. In the US, you're probably upwards of about seven or eight, if, if I have my math right. Um, in, in US, you spend about 18% of your GDP, uh, which is a huge GDP, on healthcare, which is close to $3 trillion. In India, we spend close to about just over 4% on healthcare delivery. And, and so, whereas ours is too low, yours is extremely high and clearly untenable, and that's why you're going through a, a remodeling of the way healthcare is actually being delivered, or is going to be delivered, uh, in this part of the world. Because if that's not corrected, the next big crash or depression is going to be because of un unsustainable healthcare costs in this part of the world. And this is not my quote, but the quote of uh, the chairman of Gallup worldwide. So the, the point that I'm trying to represent here is that uh, there is a, even though our national average is 1.3, if you look at the blue part of the graph, the blue bar tells you that that's really where the that's a concentration in urban centers like New Delhi, like Calcutta, like Bombay. And the red one tells you what is the availability of beds in smaller places, smaller towns or rural areas. And that's the disparity which actually challenges us quite significantly. And that's why, uh, whereas we may live in big cities like Delhi and we have absolutely world-class healthcare available to us, we're very fortunate, but the bulk of our countrymen, countrywomen, they don't have appropriate access to healthcare. Um, this, this is the part I, just, I was just mentioning. So our expenditure on healthcare has remained reasonably static as a percentage of GDP. Um, so we spend about 4.2%, US spends close to 18%, and the rest of the world is somewhere in between. And what we believe is probably a figure of around 6 to 7% is probably the right uh, you know, stable figure where we ought to be. And out of this 4.2 percentage point of our GDP, uh, one fourth or really one percentage point is the amount which is actually spent by our government. And that's really where the story is extremely different to, to what you are used to in this part of the world. That uh, bulk of healthcare expenditure in India is paid out of pocket by people. So when you go, to a hospital, when you go to a doctor, you take, the, take a wallet out and you pay for your services there and then. You're not necessarily covered by insurance. And that happens 80% um, uh, of the time, 75 to 80% of the time. And the balance part, uh, one percentage point is the money, is the, uh, is the quantum of healthcare, or one fourth of all healthcare is supported by the government, which is grossly inadequate. So the government in our country it has got an objective to raise this amount of spending to about two to three percentage points. So double it or triple it in the next five years. Whether that happens or not, we don't know. Many of us don't believe it's going to happen, but that's really what they've stipulated, and that was stipulated by the last government. Let's see what Narendra Modi now has to do. But clearly, there is a focus. Government recognizes the need to spend more money and bring a lot and do a lot more work, especially for the people who are uh, in what we term as the uh, below poverty line, which constitutes, by the way, a population of about 350 million people, more than the entire population of the United States of America. And looking after those 350 million people is really the primary focus of the government. Uh, uh, because the rest can fend for themselves and rest will look after themselves. But that really is the challenge uh, ahead of us. 
If you look at the, the delivery structure, um, the bottom of the pyramid, or the reverse part of the, the cone of the pyramid that's rural, that represents about 65 to 70% of our population. The market there is highly unregulated, and the resources available to 70% of our population is about, constitutes about 15% of national resources in terms of doctors, in terms of medicines, in terms of expenditure. And that's really a, a big, big problem today. If you look at any specialists like cardiologists, neurologists, etc., cetera, uh, bulk of them, about 90 to 95% of them are centered in larger towns. And therefore, small towns do not have an ability. So even if I'm a, let's say, a rich farmer staying 150 kilometers out of New Delhi, uh, I may have the money, but I don't have a hospital to go to. Because, and why isn't there a hospital? If the private sector were, was to set up a hospital there, there would be very few people who would actually be able to pay for services. And if they're not able to pay for services, the hospital can't run. And I think that's really the, the, uh, the big issue. The other part is that in India, we have about 60,000 registered hospitals. And these uh, may, in terms of numbers, may appear very large, but about 85% of them are literally what we call as doctor clinics, doctor chambers, which have actually grown into small nursing homes. So a doctor who's become successful in a local locality has converted his house into a nursing home and he's providing care. And a lot of it is reasonably good care because it is curing people and that's considered as a hospital. And that's about 85% of the 60,000 hospitals. Only less than 1% of them are more than 200 bed hospitals where we believe largely uh, tertiary care work is carried out. Tertiary care work is where high-end surgical work, like maybe cardiac surgery or knee replacements, etc. that sort of work carries on. And that's, so this market is extremely fragmented. Um, the largest players like Fortis or Apollo, uh, we have almost no market share of the entire population, if you really look at it, of the uh, entire business. So if the entire business is about $75 billion, our Indian turnover is just uh, over 0.6 or 0.7 billion dollars, which is less than 1% of, uh, you know, um, of the entire thing. So there's, the market share actually doesn't come into play. And by the time, if we come up to about 5% market share, then we begin to influence the way healthcare is actually going to be delivered in our country in any significant manner. And because of this, healthcare is largely unregulated. We may have regulations, we may have laws, but an ability to implement, to monitor, to ensure compliance is absent in large tracts of our country. Um, if you look at this particular slide, what it tells you at, at, a, at a very, uh, at, at a large part of it, that bulk of the healthcare infrastructure belongs to the government in the country. So they have created over the last 60, 70 years that we've been an independent country after the British went off, uh, they, they created, you know, uh, district hospitals, like primary care centers and many other centers and which constitutes in terms of infrastructure about 75 to 80%. You know, 20%, 25% belongs to the private sector, people like us or doctors who have their own nursing homes. But when you look at the, the patient flow, uh, the private sector actually is catering to about 70% of the patients. And this largely is because the government facilities are largely underserved. They either don't have doctors or the infrastructure is breaking up or diagnostics are not working, they don't have medications, and this is the real challenge. So when people fall sick, they, they know that they're going to have to pay a lot more money than they can afford, but they prefer to beg, borrow, steal, and go to a private sector hospital rather than go to the government facility. So that's a, that's a conundrum that we have got to sort out going forward. Um, so this is, it's simply to sort of sum up this part of the uh, discussion, that we have 20% of the world's population, 17% um, of the world's population, 20% of the disease burden. We have only 7% of the world's doctors. So we have about 700,000 doctors who are in the, from the allopathic field, 7, 800,000, you know, which is very, very low. The, the need in our country is to have perhaps closer to 2 million doctors. And that's an issue. We need to generate many more doctors and do it as of yesterday, but that's not going to happen. So we've got to f figure out ways of solving our problems, which are manageable. And we have about only 5% of the world's beds. Now, that's good and bad because if we don't ha have adequate number of beds, we've got to think innovatively and not necessarily follow the route that's been followed by mature countries like the US and many other countries. 
It's just like mobility. We didn't have fixed line telephones many years ago, and it took us three years to get a telephone connection in India if you wanted a fixed line, but then the mobile phones came and landscape changed dramatically. And today, I think 850 million people today have mobile phones in a country. Um, I now want to move on to another part, which perhaps may be of great interest to you. Um, you know, and, and, um, and this is really in two parts, uh, the left side of the graph and right side of the graph. And this really is, is perhaps a nub, uh, and I'm actually getting to a, to a particular point, which is to speak to you about affordability issues in our country. That everybody says Indian healthcare is very cheap. And I'm going to explain to you why it is cheap. Okay, all of you are from management schools, you'll probably understand this better than anybody else. The extreme bar on the left um, gives you in dollars per annum the remuneration of, of doctors or nurses or, uh, or a resident doctor. So a staff nurse in India would earn probably about three and a half thousand dollars per annum. Uh, uh, a resident doctor about fifteen thousand um, uh, uh, dollars. A senior cardiac surgeon would earn probably about three hundred thousand dollars. And I have got some data from some leading institutions in the US because I happen to be in this domain. And the extreme, the third bar that you see there represents a real hospital in your country, uh, considered to be a center of excellence in cardiac work. And that's what is actually paid there. So about a doctor probably would be earning close to $1.2 million. A cardiologist will earn close to, again, a million dollars. Resident doctor, close to $150,000. A staff nurse, about over $100,000. Now, that's purely the remuneration that's earned by people, okay? When, when and I'll come to the second part of the graph uh, later on. When you convert it into productivity, I, want, I, I have done some sums here. The, the surgeon in our hospital, and this I'm talking about a Fortis hospital, will do about 100 surgeries in a month, which is about 1,200 surgeries in a year. In the US, from this particular hospital, the, the surgeon does about 25 surgeries in a month, which means 300 surgeries in a year. Now you do the multiplication. The, the doctor there is, is doing four times as much work, earning a salary which is one-fourth. So the productivity factor, just for, on a doctor basis, and this is, not, this is not to say that doctors are paid very heavily here, it's simply to say that manpower costs, people costs, are so high, whether it's a nurse, whether it's an administrator, whether it's a resident doctor, whether it's a specialist, that the productivity is just not delivered. I was, I was on the weekend with a, with a uh, cardiovascular surgeon. I spent the, the night with him, uh, you know, a good friend of mine. And I met a doctor over dinner. This guy earns over half a million dollars, and he does, guess how many surgeries in a year? 70 surgeries. Now, the economics can't work. Somebody has to pay for it. The country pays for it, or the people pay for it. And that's one of the major factors why healthcare is so expensive. The second part that happens is on, on the extreme right, which is about creating hospitals. In India, if I set up a high-end tertiary care hospital, it costs me close to about 200, 250,000 US dollars per bed, 200,000 US dollars, and I can get us absolutely state-of-art facility that we've just recently opened in Gurgaon, which some of you may have seen. Um, an equivalent sort of a hospital in the US is anywhere between 1.5 million to $2 million per bed. Add to that the medical legal expenses and you have a, a system which seems to be totally out of whack because in our hospital we use the same technology. We have doctors who are certified from this part of the world. We have hospitals which are JCI, Joint Commission International Accredited, and, and that's the structure that we operate. And so what happens is that when you, when you actually take it up there, that those are the sort of cost comparisons. So a cardiac surgery in a hospital will cost about $6,000 as opposed to anywhere between 70 to 130 or 40 or 1,000 in this part of the world. And that sort of comparison just carries on. And you have a, a healthcare system which is, uh, which is highly imbalanced. You know, we had, the, we, had a, we had a team from Kaiser Permanente, their chairman, who visited us last month. And uh, uh, he was going, he met our doctors, he went through our hospitals. And he said, you know, at the end of the day, he, says, and he sent a mail after that, saying in every public meeting that I've gone to, I've been speaking about the fact uh, that Indian healthcare has a lot to teach us because of the way that they are delivering care. Earlier on, we were, the question that we used to ask is, is it possible? Today, we are saying, 
But today, what I'm saying is that it is possible because I've seen it, we've got to figure out a way to now translate some of those mechanisms in our own country. And I think that's the, and, and why is it that we perhaps are competitive? The reason is very simple. People can't pay. We have an open market. Patients have a choice to go to any doctor, any hospital. So they're not dictated by anybody to go to a particular doctor or a particular hospital. And market actually determines the price. And therefore, even if I run the fanciest hospital in the country, I can't necessarily uh, command multiple levels of, of costing. And therefore, we, are, we have an obsessive need to continuously innovate and keep our costs down. So really, um, uh, I think, I think uh, I'll just skip this part. Uh, so India Advantage is, is pretty simple. We are getting a lot of people from uh, you know, the rest of the world who are beginning to come to us because they're beginning to find that quality is very good, infrastructure is excellent, doctors are superb, and clinical outcomes are perhaps second to none. And that provides uh, for a very compelling proposition. Now this part is a bit about Fortis. He was the founder of our, um, of our chain. And he spoke about creating an integrated healthcare system built upon on the principles of efficiency, uh, clinical excellence, and compassionate patient care. And over the, over the, I think this now, we've just entered the 14th year. We've, we've grown quite dramatically. That was the year when we set up our first hospital. Uh, I came into the system just after that in 2002. So I've been pretty much part of this entire journey of this organization. And we have, we have acquired hospitals, we've diversified, we've, you know, so it happens every single day. So depending on what day of the week it is, our number of hospitals can change actually, depending on what we've divested, what we've acquired. Um, and we today are sitting on about 66 hospitals, which are spread across the country. We have about 5,000 operational beds and uh, with a total capacity of about 10,000 beds, which really means that an, at, an, at an incremental investment, we can actually go up to a pretty high capacity. And what the, this, this slide is simply telling us that we are a pretty large group. Uh, we run hospitals. We also run uh, Southeast Asia's largest diagnostic chain uh, called SRL. We run um, pharmacies. We have a health insurance business. So it's a pretty large group, and that's really what this is trying to, the slide is trying to tell you. And in terms of gamut of specialties, we operate everything. We've got great transplant programs, including the heart transplant program, which is unfortunately not mentioned there. But every super specialty that exists here exists there. Perhaps in some of your centers of excellence, stuff is being done at a higher level in Cleveland Clinic or Mayo Clinic. But I would, I would reckon that about 99.9% .9 of the stuff is actually happening in our country at very, very affordable rates and to very good clinical outcomes and, uh, uh, you know, uh, this thing. Number two, if you really look at uh, the sort of work that we do, we do very large volumes. So, uh, so many of the doctors that we speak to, they get astounded at the number of surgeries that, that are actually carried out in our system. And this is simply to tell you that we do pretty large. We do almost 30,000 angioplasties every year. We do uh, you know, 16,000 cardiac bypass operations, so on and so forth. You know. Very, very large. In terms of medical tourism and medical value travel, we get people from largely all over the world, but, la but mainly from the surrounding countries, Africa, Middle East, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and they come in for a lot of elective procedures to our country. Um, and this is simply representing the portfolio that we have in our hospitals. About 10% of annual revenues is from overseas patients, and this market is growing at a pretty rapid rate, about almost 30 to 40% per annum. Now, there are five themes that we have actually, which we are pursuing, which are going to be long-term themes. One is that we are pursuing clinical excellence in a very significant manner. So we have the largest number of hospitals which are joint commission accredited or NABH accredited, which are the national standards, which draw their regulations from uh, the best from Australia and the best from the US. Uh, number two, uh, there's a lot of work that we've done in what we call as in fine-tuning the medical operating system. So we have something called the medical operating system, which is looking at standardization. So in many ways, we, we talk the McDonald's language when we talk internally, that how can we make sure that we are able to do repeatable and replicable work and produce clinical outcomes um, uh, in a consistent manner? How can we make patient experience happen, which is absolutely consistent? And, and, and we have a quality program that we monitor across a large number of our hospitals, all the large ones especially, and these are monitored every day, uh, mon uh, reviewed every month, and the program is increased. In fact, we had some high-end consultants you know, from US and from Europe, and when they came and they looked at our system, they said that you are the only group in the country who's actually doing this. You're far ahead of the game, and this is in India, it doesn't 
I think compared to some of the hospitals here, but the journey has started. Number two, um, in, in clinical excellence innovation, what is it that we are doing here? I'm just giving you one example. We've, we've got a pro program called Critinext. So we've set up a, a remote station in Delhi in one of our large hospitals, and we operate about 140 ICU beds, which are about 1,000 or 1,500 miles out of Delhi. So critical care patients in those hospitals are actually monitored by intensivists sitting out of Escorts Heart Institute in Delhi. Uh, because intensivists are not available in, in those remote areas in the small towns. And we've trained the local junior doctors there to interact with the senior doctors. And a large number of lives have actually been saved. And there are thousands of patients we are beginning to now look at uh, through that mechanism. And this is just one example of how we can use modern technology to leapfrog, to provide care and keep our costs highly manageable. Uh, so we don't necessarily need to do everything that has been done in the developed nations. It is a means uh, you know, of moving into the future for us because we can't wait for infrastructure to come up and more intensivists be produced. But we can make sure that our intensivists are very productively utilized. Rather than looking only at 12 patients, each one of them is looking after 30 or 40 patients with real-time data of every single parameter uh, on the computer screen. Um, we, the second major theme that we are looking at after clinical excellence is really improving patient experience. And this is really in two buckets. Um, one is that we, we have standardized a lot of patient-facing processes, almost 171 processes in a hospital. And this means that we are able to predict the level of service. When we started this exercise, we used to take, just for diagnostics, lab turnaround times. On an average, we used to take about seven and a half hours to, to um, you know, we aggregated all the tests. We said, how much time do we take before we report? It was about seven and a half hours. By the when, time we went through this exercise, we brought down the time to about one hour. And we've, we've done this in terms of uh, length of stay. Length of stay in a particular hospital where we ran this efficiency program, it actually came down from 6.2 days down to three and a half days, which really means that you've actually doubled the capacity of the hospital without investing a single buck and you're simply running your operations in a far more efficient manner, turning around patients. They don't need, there's not a hotel, they don't need to stay longer than they need to, but everybody, the doctors also get into the planning cycle and they begin to look at how can we get the patient out sooner rather than later and the patient doesn't need to stay. It's great for, from a cost point of view, efficiency point of view, and from the patient care point of view. The other part that we are looking at is all the so software aspects of patient that how do we make a patient experience feel good so that by the time he leaves the hospital, he or she, they, they feel that they've been to a good facility. We've not got where we want to, but there's a lot of focus happening on patient communication, on shared decision making, patient engagement. We've created self-help groups in different uh, categories, people who are in perpetual you know, uh, long-term dialysis or uh, who, who are cancer patients, and we, we get them to hospitals and we look after them in a very significant manner. And, and this does a lot of great work uh, for them. The other part that we are looking at is, um, the third theme that we are focusing on, on is about talent. We have a big issue in our country. Our attrition rates for nurses is around close to 50%. So every two years, every nurse literally is new. And junior doctors who manage patient care 24 hours uh, in the wards, attrition rates there are about 40% because they, there's a shortage of doctors in our country, shortage of nurses in our country. Nurses want to go to the Middle East for dollar salaries, and that's not something you can hold on to. So there's a lot of development work that we actually do in terms of training and development, and making sure that there's a career progression for our clinicians taking place, and huge amount of investment which is taking place in this domain. The fourth pillar uh, for us uh, as Fortis Healthcare is Community Connect. And we've got a large number of programs that are focused on the community or on CSR activities. So whether it's looking after neighborhood parks or giving health talks or Sunday conversations on a particular disease, um, creating awareness around preventative health, etc. All that is being focused on in a significant manner. We do a lot of charitable work as well. This little kid that you see here, this is a kid uh, who is from Bangladesh of very poor patients. Her head was about that size, almost like a Martian that you see, you know, it's called what? Hydrocephalus, uh, this condition. And um, so we brought her to a hospital, our, our top end neurosurgeons amongst the best in the country. They looked after her. She was in a hospital for about two months. Uh, the treatment would have been unaffordable by perhaps many of us out here, but this was done 
free of cost. And we've, we did about 350 cardiac surgeries for children in collaboration with Being Human Foundation, which belongs to Salman Khan. So in collaboration with them, we did free surgeries for about 350 children just in our Gurgaon hospital. And so there's a lot of work that we do. There are a lot of issues that we have in our country, uh, especially around the female girl child and um, uh, acid attack victims. And we do a lot of free work for them. But it's really because we are in the private sector, we need to make sure that we do stuff which is sensitive towards the community and that community views us as an integral part of, of the system. And the fifth part that we do, which is around financial viability and making sure that investors continue to have confidence in this organization. The fact of the matter is that uh, uh, we are a private sector player. We don't get a free lunch anywhere. We've got to be efficient, we've got to make sure that our financials work, our p &L account is sustainable and that we can survive in perpetuity. And therefore, we need to create a surplus so that we can invest it back in the system, in people, technology, uh, systems processes, IT, patient care, etc. And that is a very, very compelling need. Um, unfortunately, in our country and perhaps the rest of the world, healthcare is looked, on, looked at from an egalitarian perspective, that it must be free. Unfortunately, private healthcare cannot be free. It has to stand its own feet and it is it has to be very, very competitive. And therefore, there's a lot of work that we actually do in this part. So the lower part that, that we are talking about is making sure it's, it's really a business that how do we, we look at our average revenue per occupied bed? How do we improve that? How do we reduce the length of stay and therefore turn over <coughs> asset utilization? We improve it. How do we flog our technology faster? How do we use, leverage technology to look after more patients and therefore become more and more efficient? I just want to give you one stat. And this is pretty astounding. When I joined this uh, one of our hospitals in 2002, I, I was not from the healthcare sector, chemical sector. I, I looked at some of the financials. I did a, a study of about 100 cardiac surgeries and I found that we were spending about 80,000 rupees was the input cost into a cardiac surgery. So I looked at a lot of variations. I talked to my cardiac surgeon, the guy I stayed with over the weekend. He was there along with my chief anesthetist. I said, why is there so much variation? And these guys are very bright. When, when you ask them the right questions, and it wasn't about challenging them, it was simply asking them. They went back and they figured out. And we put into place a lot of systems. But in, in three months' time, we had actually brought down the cost of a cardiac surgery by 50%. So we spent 80,000 rupees on a cardiac surgery in the year 2002. Uh, in three months' time, we brought it down to close to about 45,000 rupees. And guess what we are spending today? We are spending somewhere between 25 to 30,000 rupees in today's money. Okay, on a cardiac surgery, uh, where our, our um, uh, morbidity, mortality rates compared to the best in the world, and these are clinical outcomes, which are almost mirrored on the STS database that you have in the US. And I think that's the great part. So we, we work on, on different aspects, and that, uh, that is a compulsion that we need to continuously focus on in every single day. And finally, what is the roadmap for our country? And this is my last slide. Um, key growth drivers, number one, our government is committed to spending more money on healthcare. Like I said, one percentage point is going, likely to go up to two to three percentage points. People are becoming more prosperous. So one percent of population becoming prosperous means 13 million people coming into this thing. Non-communicable diseases is a problem and therefore people like us have to invest money because if we didn't invest money, bulk of the tertiary care work, by the way, is done by private sector. So Fortis, Apollo, Max, Manipal, all, all these chains, you know. Um, higher insurance penetration. Today, insurance only covers about 50 to 20 percent of our population. Hopefully, this, this figure is actually going to go up. A government has launched several social insurance programs for the below poverty line people. Uh, medical tourism is going to become, is, is becoming big and that's going to become bigger in, in private equity is beginning to come and invest. Uh, I think every year the private equity investments have been going up by about 25-30% year on year. And that's, we, I think we've got investment of a close to about one and a half billion dollars in India. So what are the key themes? What direction does India need to go to? And these are at a very high level. I think we have an opportunity now to, to, to bring about significant change. We need to go into preventive care. That's what the world is talking about now. How can we make sure that people actually don't fall sick? How can they have better habits? Um, how can we move into frugal innovation? And there's a lot of work. I just gave you one example, but there are 
several examples I can, I can give you a two hour talk just on, on innovation that we've done in India that's available to all of us. Leveraging big data, that's, there's a lot of talk about it, but that's beginning to, uh, now we, we are talking, we have already had a collaboration with NASCOM, the Healthcare Federation of India, and we are looking at developing a big data, you know, database which will benefit the country because statistics are, are uh, almost non-existent in a country. Leapfrogging opportunities, leveraging technology, mobile, mobility, etc., to provide healthcare, and uh, mobile health and devices to create a disease-free India. So this is a is a very large agenda, but there is the discussions have started, and I think. Um, people like us and many, many like us, we are not the only people who are doing this. Um, people are experimenting in new models, they are putting in their money, private equity is, is, is pumping in money. There are a lot of youngsters who, are, who have a lot of guts and uh, you know, courage to try out new models. Some of these models are not succeeding, but uh, the point of the matter is that people are falling, they are getting up and they are running again. And I think our story is going to be pretty fascinating as we move into the future. So thank you for your patience. I think I have over there. You know, Daljit, first of all, welcome to New York and you, uh, it's really a great opportunity and a privilege to have you here. Uh, I very diligently had a lot of questions yes. and I didn't see your slides and you covered all the answers. <laughs> so now I'm in trouble, I don't know what I'm going to ask you. But um, let me just um, ask a couple of uh, questions and I know that a number of our friends have come from different places and uh, they want to really talk to you and it will be good to really converse with them. Um, Let's talk about the government. You know, nowadays, uh, I've been away from India for almost 40 years, and everybody says the country is modified. <laughs> Not even modified. That it is, yes. <laughs> and, you know, since, uh, so, so, you know, there's a lot of expectation, there's a lot of optimism. Have you seen any change, or do you feel there is a mandate for healthcare from the government? I, I think government uh, has, is making the right noises. But having said that, the last several decades, every government has made a lot of promises on, in the domain of healthcare, but very little has actually happened. And I think there is belief, sir, that uh, the current government is committed to make things happen. I think we've got a good health minister who's a, uh, who's a doctor. Uh, he's a, he's a, he seems to be a very nice human being as well. Uh, that's unusual for politicians, as you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but we think that change will happen. Uh, having said that, I, I don't see, including um, uh, under the leadership of Mr. Modi, that things are going to change dramatically overnight. I mm -hmm. think it's almost like when Mr. Obama came here, the worldwide we all celebrated, you know, but reality sometimes is much tougher. And therefore, but having said that, Modi has uh, got a great track record of performance um, and he is going to bring about change, but perhaps not meet the euphoric expectations that people necessarily have. But change we will see, and we will see for the better. Right. But I'm you no know, about the government has been payer and provider. Yes. And the question is that should the government be in both businesses? Because they can be payer, but maybe the provider part is coming from like the private organization. Yes, I, I think you know we've spoken to the government um, over several years, uh, and we've tried to explain to them that perhaps being a provider is not a great uh, great way to go it's forward. It's not working, right? It's, it doesn't work and it, it'll never work. Government can never be in the business of service or be in the business of business, you know. Having said that, there is a inherent mistrust between the, pri between the government views private sector that if you make money out of healthcare, you guys are not good guys. But the fact of the ma matter is that if somebody is investing his dollars on putting up a hospital, on paying salaries, and making sure it's a sustainable system, and then making maybe 10% at the end of the day, which is going to be for further investment, why should anybody really be concerned? Because today, if private sector did not do that, we wouldn't be where we are in terms of whether it's medical tourism or have the sort of hospitals that we today have, which, which frankly compared to some of the best facilities that you've seen. Um, the chairman of Kaiser Permanent SA said he had never seen a hospital as good as the one that he's seen in Gurgaon, the one that we formed. Oh, now that's a great comment. You know. So you know, so that leads me to yeah. ask you and uh, basically get your insight into these things. You know, when I look at the U.S. health system or even for the U.K., you know, it's a pity that uh, healthcare has nothing to do with health, right? It's sick care. Sick care. It is yeah. nothing to do even sick care. It's sick procedures because there is no code for me to go to you. And you are the doctor and say, Surya, you don't really need any medicine. You can't earn money. 
So, the, you know, we have a system in the United States which is episodic care, which is very driven fee-for-service. And when I look at India and when I look at all the consulting reports, it looks to me, and this is what I want you to correct me, is that the India is following the Western medicine. That, you know, we have a tertiary care, we have a fee-for-service, we have a hospital. But as you touched, there are a lot of innovation in India. You know, India didn't, you know, you know leapfrogged in cell phones and... Uh, Shouldn't, shouldn't, be, shouldn't there be more preventative care and primary care so it can touch 500 million people rather than just the 2 or 3 percent of the top? I, I think you've hit, a, hit on a very important point and I think that de debate is now happening in the country. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you've seen, you probably have, would have read the report of the HLAG, the High Level Expert Group on Healthcare. I know you were part of the steering committee of the McKinsey report. Yeah, yeah, that's right, okay. that's right. Now, the, the report has very clearly said that there is a need for us to move from disease management to preventive care. And that's the point I'm just mentioning. And the government is acutely aware of it because if it manages issues related to public health well, right. um, if it moves into education, today we all say health is important, but the fact of the matter is that nobody learns about health. Right. There is no curriculum, uh, be it in the school, or college, none of us have learned about health. You know, we have learned about mathematics, we have learned how to read the periodic table and learn Shakespeare, which happened 400 years ago. <laughs> but when it comes to our own health, nothing has happened. And I think that is the shift that needs to happen. Unless it becomes part of my day-to-day -day life uh, from the time that I'm born uh, and good habits are inculcated, nothing's going to change. But, you know, will you so, so that's that's the big change that has to happen, but it has to happen through what we are, we call as the multi-stakeholder effort, which right. really means healthcare providers, educationists, F and B companies, uh, the entire ecosystem has to support healthy living, and and that's a very significant change. So doctors' roles have to move in in many ways. Or so you have to have a set of doctors whose primary role is to keep him fit, him fit, me fit, and you know, saying, are you doing your exercise? Are you eating well? Are you doing this? Rather than, oh, buddy, sorry, you gotta, you, I'm going to put a stent inside you. You know, that should not arrive or that should not happen. That must happen at the last stage if it has to happen. So the roles of doctors also need to change. We, we are training doctors only to do great surgery. Right, but we are, not, we are not equipping them to counsel, to share, and to act as a coach and a mentor, which happens in... Uh, you know, in organizations. But you know, here's the dilemma because in the United States it's the same thing. You know, yeah. you talked about the healthcare cost going for 2.8 or 3 trillion yeah. dollars, and yeah. we have 100 million people who have chronic disease. Absolutely. 40 million of them have more than three. So this uh, healthcare cost is growing exponentially. So Obamacare, which we you know fondly call it new healthcare, is accountable care organizations. It's going from pay fee for service pay for quantity, from pay for quantity to pay for quality. Now, it has created some problem. In the last uh, weeks, uh, the Credit Suisse report says, and it will be interesting to see, the year-over-year -year increase in uh, inpatient surgery has only increased 0.4% because the incentive is to really reduce the number of days people go to the hospital and have a surgery. But the outpatient has gone up to 2.4% and the emergency room is going to 1.4%. So, you know, it is moving slowly, and now the hospitals have started creating something called navigators. Yeah. So these people go to the emergency room, and they see the patients, yeah. and you probably know this. And then, so, so the whole in incentive here is that how do you really keep people away from the surgery, which is the incentives are misaligned, because some of the doctors went there because that is fee for service. In India, I don't think you can really create a hospital for preventative care and primary care because there's just not enough money for people to pay to pay the doctors and build a hospital. I, I agree with you, but I think uh, where it has to start is, uh, I think preventive care and primary care is still falls within the domain of the government in many ways, public health. Right. Um, but education is not something that the private sector can invest in because private sector means if I'm investing uh, you know, my money, I need to see a return happening. And I think that's the big issue. And this is compounded by the fact that today availability of doctors is, is very limited. And that's a challenge that primary care centers face. You hire a doctor and he's away in, in one year's time. And so there is no common same face that a person sort of gets used to and creates trust and, you know, goes to the same doctor again and again. 
Because by the time he builds trust, that fellow's gone to do his masters or do you know high-end stuff, and the other other guys left. But the shift necessarily needs to take place in this domain. And I think the point that you touched about misaligned incentives, you're absolutely right. This is the only, or perhaps one of the few, few uh, businesses in the world where people are paid to do something but are not held accountable for results. Right. And that's unacceptable. <coughs> and I think where the world has to move to, uh, you know, is that there's got to be some predictability, some accountability. So if I'm a doctor and I'm looking after your health, I better make sure that I'm paid to keep you healthy rather than to fix whatever problems that you have. You know, I mean, if you have a problem, then I need to be penalized in some ways. Well, you know, again, it's, it's a, but we need to put it on, put it on its head. I mean, we need to, we need to pay people, reward people for what we want. Right. So again, it is the wall problem. You know what we call the three-headed monster, right? You have to prove, you have to solve the affordability issue. Sure, sure. And even the best Indian hospitals like AMIS and uh, ICR and all Tata Memorial, it's not really available to common people. You know, you have to have a government somebody writing to you so that you can go to all in medical science per hospital. So it's not available to them. And not for profit, for profit hospitals, they cannot afford it. So, you know, when you come to accessibility and affordability and quality, you know, sometimes I wonder actually who is going to take the leadership to solve it. Certainly government cannot do it. And the private entrepreneurs, you know, you have whatever it is, it has a financial sustainability. And if there is a private equity money, there is actually people looking at how you make money in three or five years. Yeah. And that drives to more procedures. You know, I, I've, I've got a, I, I was doing some math, and I'll just share this with you. You know, in India, if, we, if I want insurance for myself, um, I need to pay about, if I pay 3,000 rupees, about 3,000 rupees, I am covered for rupees 5 lakhs, 500,000 of medical exp expenditure. And rupees 5 lakhs medical expenditure means I can afford to have two cardiac operations in a year. Okay, just to, just to um, that's the equivalence, okay? Now, India spends close to what we, I, I said about 300,000 crores, yeah. or that's, 3,000, 3 billion uh, rupees on healthcare, right? Now, if I was to take, put this money that I'm spending today on insurance, I could technically buy an insurance for every Indian to cover him for five lakhs of rupees. Now tell me which hospital would not look after them? But, so there is a, so mathematically it's, it is there. So is there a role of the employers? You know, there's a large Of course there's a role of the employers, the role of the government, yeah. but the end, and I think these are sort of policy changes that we need to bring about. That there's enough for an insurance company to make money. If the insurance money is prepared to sell me and you, I mean, you are going to India, that's, that's what you need to pay for your insurance, you know? And if you could cover every Indian with the total amount of money that we spend that I've shown you there, in many ways, you, we, we, are, we have actually surplus available to us, even in, given the ex uh, existing expenditure. I'm going to open up the question for the floor, but there's one thing I want to ask. Yeah. <laughs> because you have good process, yes. you have good systems, yes. so why Fortis has not come to New York? <laughs> <laughs> it's too complex. <laughs> no, 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 but, but you know, well, I, I, I think that is, yeah. that is actually an opportunity of bringing innovation, because it's yeah, not only yeah. a labor arbitrage, right? No, I agree. You have improved the no, process. It, I agree with you, but I think the issue, sir, is um, uh, healthcare delivery is very local in its, uh, in its application, the regulations, just to so we understand. So you don't want to see Fortis in the U.S.? Not for a while, I think. Okay. Or just <laughs> asking. Hopefully, as the world becomes even flatter, maybe. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure. Okay, let's, uh, you know, why don't you use the microphone over there and uh, please announce your uh, name and affiliation and then ask the question, please. Uh, uh, first of all, Daljit, uh, thank you for being here. It's an honor to be here today to listen to you and Surya. State your name and sure. My name is Shiv Nikam. I'm a vascular surgeon in Pennsylvania. Uh, and I'll give you a little bit of background about <coughs> why I'm asking this question. I trained in India. I was a general surgeon in India. Uh, worked in the Indian kind of uh, pay, payment system. Moved to England. I, I'm board certified surgeon, FRCS in England. Worked in the socialized medicine uh, structure. Then moved to U.S. Uh, in the capital, uh, capitalistic economy, became a general surgeon, board certified general surgeon, vascular surgeon for the last nine years. And I really experienced these three different models. That's why I came to uh, Columbia Business School to understand the business of delivery of healthcare. And I work for an integrated healthcare delivery system, which is pioneering changing the healthcare delivery in America today. 
for Geisinger Health System, which is a leader in moving from fee-for-service uh, fee to uh, payment for performance to reward for value, which is probably the higher level of going where we need to go. And I really find it very insightful as to what you're trying to do. And Surya's question that was about how can you be rewarded for preventative care when that's not in the interest of your business model, uh, I get the feeling that with the founder created the idea of having a, a integrated healthcare delivery system where you are rewarded for the health of the society in an integrated format is what we would create a business model. But I just wonder whether you want the involvement of government of India to be higher, which we here think is a problem and a private sector model with enough penetration across India, like you are growing just now, probably is a better model for the uh, nation rather than government having its mandate. Would you not be in a better situation where you make money and there's nothing wrong with making money, that's what I believe here. Uh, you grow, you have enough penetration throughout India and it's your corporate social responsibility that spills over into good health care for millions of Indians. What's wrong with that model rather than expecting the government to take a bigger role? I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I only uh, believe that given the current state of maturity of a country, the ability for people to pay for those services today is extremely limited. And as a, as a corporation, as a corporate entity, we've got to decide what is the focus area for us. Is my specialization going to be in primary health? Is it going to be in secondary health? Is it going to be in tertiary health? Is it going to be quaternary health? And I need to focus on that because I have limited resources. But as the organization matures, as the country matures, we will willy-nilly get into different domains of healthcare. So we've got into, uh, into the insurance space, we've got into the pharmacy space, we've got into diagnostics, we've got into secondary and tertiary care and quaternary care today, okay, as, a, as an organization. But we found it extremely difficult to operate a hospital and we've shut down two or three of our hospitals in, in very small towns because they just, we just can't, either we don't have the capability or we don't have a model which actually succeeds. And I suspect is the, is the first part because we are so geared to looking after the high-end uh, sort of NCD type of problems that uh, the lower end secondary care model we really don't understand. It's like, you know, do you make a, do you make a Mercedes Benz? Uh, and do you also make a, a Nano, which costs you, you know, $2,000? The fact is, my expertise can be either this or that. Perhaps it's going to be very challenging to do both. But I agree with you, and I think, and having said that, there are a number of private sector organizations who are moving to this domain, including an organization that uh, Surya is, you know, mentoring, you know. So HCL is there, HealthSpring is there, many others who are trying these models. Thank right. you. Okay. Welcome. Please, please go to the microphone. Uh, uh, you know, please state your yeah. name and affiliation and ask the question. Okay, uh, Raman Kapoor, uh, Chairman of the World India Diabetes Foundation, non-profit after spending 30 years on the profit side or more. Um, you know, we've looked at things on a macro basis and I just wonder if you could address uh, a more micro issue, taking diabetes as an example, and if you could provide us with an algorithm for uh, dealing with India's challenges in the field of diabetes, because as you mentioned, India is, the, is becoming, uh, perhaps second to China, the diabetes capital of the world. I think the Indian problem is uh, one of the major issues that we have is a lack of diagnosis today. And when we talked to the previous health, health minister about on the problem on, uh, on diabetes as well as on other uh, NCD related problems, uh, he said, you know, I, I want the private sector to help me in carrying out blood tests of populations in different regions. But the point is, then he's, uh, and the flip side of that is that I'm going to pay you 10 rupees. You know, 10 rupees, by the way, is what? One seventh of a dollar, <laughs> okay? To do a, a, a blood test and a cholesterol test. Now that's, the two things are sometimes not compatible. Now the fact of the matter is that yes, we are there to help you. We'll, we'll bring crash down our rates, but I cannot fund that diagnosis. But, but the point that he mentioned, or, or um, uh, you know, he mentioned, you, you, government doesn't have the ability to do that. Right. The capacity and the ability exists only in the private sector. Mm -hmm. We can offer the lowest rates, but we are not going to offer rates which don't work for us. You know, 
And I think that's really where the issue is. And when, when that doesn't happen, there's a lack of willingness to take those first baby steps which are necessary. So first I know, I must know, you know, what is the heat map of this population. And if I know this place is red and this is orange, that's what I need to focus on. Then I begin to work on solutions. And I, I think I, that's, I so, so it's almost, almost a reluctance to work on a public-private partnership. But public-private partnership, a partnership means that both parties' objectives must be met. Both yeah. need to compromise, but largely the objectives need to be met. But I just want to add one thing. I think there is a big gap in educating the public that how you can take care of yourself a little bit. You know, if I earn X amount of money and I spend uh, X plus Y, you know, I will have no money. And everybody is looking after their economic health, but very few people are thinking about their physical health. Yes. You know, Quest Diagnostics have a laboratory in Delhi, and yes. we have done study over the last two or three years. And I can guarantee you, the next week, the blood sugar level and HPA1C <coughs> people in Delhi is going to go up by 25% because of Diwali. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Quite right. So, so, so the question is that, you know, it's not only the hospitals. It's actually there has to be some kind of knowledge of people saying that, you know, if you are really close to 99 or 100, and you can really do with less jalebi and all the stuff. And uh, that, that's, that's been really a tough thing about educating people. But, uh, so who, who's responsible for that? I mean, well, who, we have been. Actually, as uh, he said, you know, Fortis is doing with the Community Connect. Yeah. And there's, uh, every hospitals are doing some health uh, fairs. So it is actually happening. But it's also there is a language problem. It's, uh, most of the corporate people are talking about English and they're taking some literature. There's a local language. But somebody has to give some visual picture that if you take so much of sugar, here is what's going to happen to your left leg. You know, that picture is going to really create. And so, sir, let, let me just give you one quick stat. Uh, uh, in the last financial year, we looked after, we, we provided screening, health screening, which means blood tests or ultrasound and various other things, to million people in the country. And these are, this is purely without uh, charging anything. So doing free hmm. health check camps. Very but the point nice. is, but our country has got what, 1,300 million people. <laughs> and that's really the issue. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for a very informative presentation.